Hey, everybody, welcome into the podcast. We've got another special bonus episode. Bonus episode. We're coming to you today from Louisville, Kentucky. We are at Kentucky Peerless Distilling, and we're sitting here with the owner, the president, the CEO, Corky Taylor. Corky, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Corky, can you tell us a little bit about this brand, Peerless? Because you know we've been reading articles about you all, and we found out that it hasn't been produced under this name in almost a century, and you guys are resurrecting the brand. So, tell us a little bit about your history with Peerless. We are. Uh, my great grandfather Henry Craver started Peerless uh, back in 1889. Shut it down during Prohibition. At one at one time in history, he was probably the fourth or four, fourth or fifth largest distillery in the state of Kentucky out of 220 distilleries. So there were days he was making 200 barrels a day. Wow. So he wow. was a he was a pretty good sized distiller down in, in Henderson, Kentucky. Our home is Henderson, just west of here, right on the Ohio River. So that's where it all got started. I had a financial services company. I sold it, walked on a beach in Sarasota, Florida for a year and a half, most oppressed I've ever been. I said, I've got to go back to work. So mm. here I am. So I I love what I'm doing. We're bringing back the Peerless name. Um, got my son Carson involved in it, so we're having a lot of fun. Hopefully, we're making a good rye whiskey and a, and a really good bourbon. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing is, like, whenever you hear about something being gone for a century, like, we can think about 10 or 20 years, and you can remember what it was like in the 90s, you know, yeah. 20, 30 years ago. But, like, when you think about something being gone for a century and being brought back, there is some sort of excitement that you just don't get with other things. And that's really exciting. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's a history that's so exciting. I mean, we were able to get back the peerless name. He gave it up during Prohibition. I got the peerless name back. We got his actual DSP, the federal ID number, to make distilled spirits, his number 50. Mm. So uh, first time in history the government's ever gone back to give a distilled spirits plant number back to a family. Wow. So I was able to get that. So uh, And then we came out with... Um, it's been 102 years since Peerless has put out a bourbon. June the 22nd on my father's birthday, I was honoring my father because we skipped his generation. So we came out with our bourbon. Um, it's it's about four four and a half years old. So we're we're excited to get our bourbon out. Our rye whiskey's done great for us. So so we're proud of our rye whiskey. As That's well. great. Well, Corky has been generous enough to give us a pour here of the bourbon that they make at Peerless, and I'd like to go ahead and just give it a little taste. Man, you just get that good trademark sweetness oh, yeah. that you expect from a bourbon. Man. Oh, this is beautiful. You can really taste the age on it, too. And I'm yeah. so glad. You know, we, we've talked to some distilleries in the past that they really rushed to get their product out there on the market at two years. But you can just tell the difference between a two-year whiskey and a four-year, four-year whiskey. Year. This yeah. is beautiful. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we made a decision um, as a family that we were not going to source product from another company. In other words, buy it from a company, put it in a bottle and say, oh, by the way, this is Peerless. Right. We make our own. So we had to wait a little over four years to bottle this. Um, so I think we did the right thing. Not many people will do that. Uh, not many people are as crazy as I am. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, One of the but, things I love about even just in you know four or five minutes so far, you're talking about family so much. So talk to me about the importance of keeping family involved. And this is obviously your great grand great grandfather's great grandfather's legacy, yeah, yeah. And like, talk to me more about like family and keeping family involved, and how important that's been for you. Oh, that's that's the most important. Like I said, I had a I had a big company. I had a couple thousand people working in the financial services business. I sold it, um, you know, and then I had to. I, I just felt like I had to go back to work. But when I did, I wanted my family involved with me, and that's what we want to do. You know, we're we're building a family legacy here. We're not selling. We're not, I didn't build it to sell it. I've already been through all that in my life. Sure. So I built it to keep it for my kids, my grandkids, and build this. I'm the fourth generation. Carson's the fifth. I've got two of them in here running around. They're the sixth generation. So we're here to stay. And, and, that, and that's probably the most important part to me. Well, and going along with that as well, you all are working with one of the hottest names uh, in the business now in your master distiller, Caleb Kilburn. Can you tell me a little bit about how you how you found Caleb and and the process to get him to the point where he is now as master distiller? Yeah, we we we, uh, we actually found him when he was a junior in college. Wow! And he was he knew yeah. he, he knew exactly what he wanted to do in his life. 
So uh, we had worked, and he'd been to a number of different distilleries, and of course he knew he wanted to get in there. So he actually worked for us in the summer. He was he was shoveling gravel and pulling nails out of out of wood before he even thought about working or getting into the distilling business. So he saw the whole project all the way through. Wow. Uh, he 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 actually uh, came up with his own software package to run the still. The young man is brilliant. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a very smart young man. He's he's well mannered, and and I respect the knowledge that he has, but he's, he studied it hard. We made him the master distiller last Christmas at, a, at my home at a Christmas party. I think he was honored. I invited his parents. They were tickled to death. So he's, uh, he's going to be with us a long mm-hmm. time and, uh, he does a great job for us. I actually heard about that story. Uh, you know, uh, from what I read, it was a surprise. He wasn't expecting to be named master distiller because he had been working under the title of, was a head distiller. Head for a distiller. While? Correct. Sure. And when he and when he came to came to work here, I said, Caleb, you're not going to be a master distiller. You're going to be a distiller. You know, in a lot of distilleries, you people, young people, go to work and they just assume just because they're the distiller, they're the master distiller. Mm. To me, I think you have to make product. You have to make a good product. And after he came out in 2017 with the 15th best whiskey overall in the world, but the number one rye whiskey, and then April the 18th of, of 18. We're ranked the number one rye whiskey in the world. Yeah. I'd say you're a master distiller. Absolutely. So, sure. Well, that's beautiful. And I think it just ties into what Brad was talking about. It it really does feel like a tight knit group here that, that considers itself to be a family. Well, we do. We we really do. I mean, that's important. Everybody that works here, I think they feel like they are family and that they're enjoying working here. They want to be here. They're passionate. That's the main thing about it. We want everybody to be passionate about what they're trying to trying to do in life and if you're not if you don't if you're not happy where you're working you're just not a happy person sure. so we want happy people we don't we we don't have that many employees we only have about 20 22 employees and that's front to back yeah so um you know we try to try to work together and and um, we're concerned we want we want good good people absolutely you take, you take care of each other we do we absolutely important. do well, why don't we go ahead and segue then? You know, the the title of this series that we're doing is My Favorite Movie, and we reached out to Corky's assistant, and she said that the movie he wanted to talk about was called Bloodworth. And at the time, I had not heard of Bloodworth, but I looked it up, and we found out that it actually goes along with this peerless tradition of incorporating family. This movie, Bloodworth, was actually directed by Corky's son, Shane. So what what can you tell me about this film? Well, I was also the executive producer on that film, okay. too. So I'm in... I'm in the movie business with my old, with my oldest son right. Shane, but Bloodworth is is a really a unique movie. We had Chris Christopherson, Val Kilmer, Dwight Yoakam, Hilary Duff, and Earl Brown. That was in something about Mary. So the cast was basically unbelievable, yeah. and it was about a family. Chris Christopherson was an entertainer like he is today. Kind of left the family. He came back and wanted to make it up to his kids. He had three kids that were having a hard time getting back with him, but. Um, it's a it's kind of a country film, but it's done very well around the world. Uh, we won the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and my son Shane won Best Director in the Santa Barbara Film out of a hundred films. So, wow. so we're proud of that, um, and it's going all around the world. So it's that type of movie. But the cast, Chris Christopherson's a friend of mine. I really like Chris. Yeah, you know. So we we had some really good actors in the movie. Uh, Dwight Yoakam actually grew up here in Louisville, Kentucky. Sure. Grew up in Middletown, so it was like him coming home and we see each other, you know. So it's uh, and then Hillary Duff, I see Hillary out in Burbank, and I see her every mm-hmm. once in a while. She's a sweet girl, and she did a great job. And of course, Earl Brown's from Murray, Kentucky, so we've known Earl forever. So it's um, it was it was a that's by far my favorite. I've seen a lot of movies, but. You know, it's not just because I was on the executive producer side, but my son did direct it, and and we won accolades with it, and sure. uh, still, and it's still. I had somebody call me the other day. They were flying to Europe, and they watched they watched Bloodworth on Delta Airlines. Hmm. So you can yeah. you can fly on lo- you know long flights on Delta, and it's going to be on there. So yeah, and of course Netflix and all all the rest yeah. of them. So so what's it been like to be in the movie business, coming from the background that you do, and now being in the distilled spirits business? Do you? Do you find any parallels? Do you find one to be easier than the other? You know, I nothing's easy, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I do like the, I, I like the energy of the movie business. It's exciting to make movies, you know, to watch how they're done. Shane does a great job. He gets very serious. I see a different side of my oldest son. You know, when he's kind of laid back, but when there's a movie, 
he's intense and in how he does it and how he mm. drives it and how he moves people. So it's, it's, it's exciting to see him work. Um, I love the business. It's, um, but I think the distilling business is something that, that's long term to our family. So, you know, we know we want to be in this business. We wanted to be in the bourbon business. We got in the rye business because it matured faster. And we were able to put that out, so we won some pretty good accolades on our rye. No. Well, and there's something cool about, you know, as a parent, you know that your son's work is great. But it's kind of cool when you start to see accolades coming in from people who have no relation to you guys saying, hey, yeah. dude, like, this movie is really good. And this yeah. rye whiskey is really good. And, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, well, I I always knew that it was really good. But thank you for letting me know that it's really good as well. <laughs> yeah. But there's something cool about that. It is. I mean, I, I think, you know, in business, I've always tried to do things right. I mean, I was just talking about it earlier today. Somebody was asking me, and they said, why do you, why, why are you where you are? And I said, well, because I don't cut corners, mm -hmm. and I don't expect my sons to cut corners. I don't expect to cut corners in the distilling business or the movie business. You get the right actors in it, even though it's a small budget, but you do it right. Yep. You treat people right. You know, you're there. You're, you you don't just try to run everything with a computer and say, be there at such and such. You're actually there. So you're, you know, you're working with people. That's what, that's the difference in, in what I want to teach my sons. When they're running a business, I want them to be there. I want them to, you know, to understand that everything's important. Every little thing's important, yeah. no matter what you do. It's the small things that are as important as the big things. Absolutely. We've been talking with a couple of distilleries on our trip here to Kentucky, and most of them are, are newer distilleries. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we found with the new distilleries is that they value transparency above everything else in a way that we found that some of the, the older, more established names don't necessarily do. You know, we just actually did an interview with Bardstown Bourbon Company, and they're putting their mash bill right on the side of the bottle. And what I love about what you all are doing here is it's not just that you're transparent because you are, but it's also that you're creating something on a smaller scale, on a purposely smaller scale. And you're doing it with this sort of family tie-in as well. So I guess my question to you would be, have you have you seen that sort of spirit in these smaller distillers as opposed to the bigger ones as you've gotten going here? Yeah, it's 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 an interesting business. I, I, I believe not speaking about Bardstown, I know I know David down there and, and, and they're a great distillery, beautiful distillery. Sure. But I think a lot of people today that are getting into the distilling business are getting in to sell the business. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that's not what my interest is. I'm not for sale. I've been, I've been an investment banker. I've had big, big companies. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm here to stay. Yeah. So people get into it and then they want to sell it. They want to make a lot of money and go on. That's not what my interest is. I want to be here, work with people, work with my kids, try to tell them the values of how I want to run a business. And that's the way I want them to run a business. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think you have to be upfront about everything you do. Of course, I'm not going. I'm not going to give my mash bill out. We just, we just don't. We just don't do that. You sure. Know, we, we, we're, but uh, you know, I think with with the accolades that we've gotten at a very young age, only been out on the market for four or five years, kind of speaks for itself. I mean, we're we're ranked. We just won the award. There's an award sitting on the table right here. This award, that's the award that we received March the 28th in London. We, we that's we won the number one craft producer in the world. Wow, three thousand yeah. two hundred craft producers in the world. On on January the thirtieth, we won the same award in New York City. Hmm. We won the number one craft producer out of one thousand three hundred craft distilleries in the United States. Yeah. So we do it right. Absolutely. Yeah, and everything you're talking about here is the essence of distilling whiskey. And the, and we've said this before on the podcast. You can't rush whiskey you have to have patience you have to have the essence of everything you were just saying you have to have longevity you mm -hmm. have to be committed to the craft you have to be committed to what it takes to produce a good barrel and we said this at the start a lot of people might rush out a barrel at two to two and a half years and because they need the money or they need this or that well and they're putting out a, a subpar product and so everything you just said is is distilled into the essence of whiskey of patience and making sure that you are putting out the best products that you possibly can. There, that's exactly right. We, we've uh, we've looked at a lot of different ways. I know everybody. They try to go to a smaller barrel. They try to go, you know, different ways they can age product. There's different things to do. 
I'm just going to do it the old way. I, I'm going to do it the way it was 100 years ago. I'm going to put them in a rick house. I'm going to put them on ricks. I'm only going to go one floor on the rick because I want to be able to control the quality mm-hmm. of my product. So there's there's ways you can cut corners, but when you cut corners, you cut quality. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I can say, and I'm sure I can speak for Brad as well, you are not cutting quality here. No. This is fantastic no. product that you're producing. Well, thank you. And I just want to say to, to your whole family and to the whole family here at Peerless, thank you so much for having us here today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Absolutely. This has been Corky Taylor, the owner, the CEO, the president of Kentucky Peerless. And for the Film and Whiskey Podcast, I am Bob Book. Hi, I'm Brad G. We'll see you next time. Bye.